There has been, in this case, the subject of homo <laughs> has been brought up by the defense. I'm going to discuss this evidence in the case as it relates to the defendant's uh, issues. As we know, the defendant's psychiatrist, Dr. Vickery, said that the defendant feared uh, that the issue of his self would come out in the trial. Let's review the evidence according to what the defendant says. Number one, as a young teenager, he and his buddies uh, spoke about how to make taste better. We don't know who the friends were or the nature of the relationship. Number two, Mrs. Menendez was taping the defendant's calls, and so he listened to those tapes and, and he destroyed those tapes. So we don't know the subject matter of those tapes. The defendant also testified that Mrs. Menendez read his diary. We know that the defendant's mother confronted him about being gay and asked him to get a girlfriend, giving him a six-month deadline. Number four, according to the defendant, his mom didn't think much about a person being gay and that Mr. Menendez called him a f and hated f We know that the defendant, although he bought new furniture for his uh, Marina City Club apartment, brought his bed with him as well, this bed that his father supposedly f him on and, and um, f him on. He took that with him. We know that the defendant claimed that his father made him get into a certain position on the bed and he said that the bed had this edge on it that was kind of uh, rough on his knees. Three months after the murders, with his father no longer around, he purchases bumper pads for his bed. And you wonder, why would he do that? His father's dead and, and no one's making him do what he says his father made him do. Now, according to the defendant's testimony, he had his cousin Andy Connell destroy or conceal evidence from his Marina City Club apartment. We don't know what that evidence was. Finally, with respect to that, that issue, when asked, what did you think when your father, who's having sex with you, is talking about being And Eric Menendez responds, I didn't think that what dad and I was doing was a gay thing. Yet, his expert comes in and says he had a fear of uh, having his own body apparently come out. Indeed, if the defendant were engaging in consensual activity with other uh, men, that would account for his being able to describe what he described for you, his encounters with his father. Now this brings us to the discussion of the defendant's claims then of some because Mrs. Abramson asked, uh, what's the reason for not questioning the defendant on the allegations? Well, number one, it would have been fruitless. We know that the defendant is an accomplished liar. As Mrs. Abramson stated yesterday, you don't get a person to say they lied on the stand, and you weren't going to get that out of Mr. Menendez. The other way to challenge evidence, such as the evidence in this case, is to call your own expert witnesses to say, that is a made-up story. It doesn't fit the research. It doesn't fit the way other kids talk about it. I don't believe him. He didn't have the right demeanor when we spoke. He didn't give the right kind of details. There's a lot of research, as you learned, going on in the field and other forms of child There are people conducting studies all over the country. We called expert witnesses, first of all, frankly, to tell you that he was telling the truth, that in their opinion, and they were qualified, internationally respected experts, that in their opinion, he was That's why we called them to overcome what we knew would be the prosecution saying, ah, it didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Because Mr. Kuriyama doesn't want you to think it happened. He doesn't want you to believe it. And a lot of people have a hard time believing that these things happen. That's been the tragedy in this country with child for so long. People, you don't want to believe people do this to their kids. You wouldn't do this to your kids. And you wouldn't want anybody you know to do this to your kids. And you don't want to believe it happens, and there's a lot of resistance to it. And there's a lot of resistance because we don't respect children very much in this country, in spite of all the lip service that we give to child issues. We think children lie. We think children make things up. We think children fantasize. So when children are victims, we scrutinize them differently than we do adults. So they have a hard time, these children, convincing the grown-up world that bad things are happening to them. And so we brought in these experts to validate, flat out, what he was saying. After your 50 hours of the interview with Eric Menendez, did you formulate an opinion as to whether or not he was a person who was as a child and adolescent? Yes, I did. And what is that opinion? My opinion was that he was.
Now, you don't have to believe, believe him just because the experts do. Clearly, you don't. You are the judges of the facts. You have to decide, did it happen on your own? And not because Dr. Burgess, who works with the FBI, even though she's got terrific law enforcement credentials, has worked with law enforcement for years and years, cannot be called a defense-biased witness. Even if she believes him, you don't have to believe him. Even if Dr. Vickery comes in here and tells you what kind of person Eric really is. He's always been a very emotional person, a sensitive person. You don't have to believe him either, because you get to decide the facts. But we brought you these people so you'd have some help in making that decision. And beyond that, we brought in the experts on a so that you would understand why it is that a kids see the world differently than you or I. And therefore, why it is that a kids could honestly believe that their parents were going to kill them and take this action motivated by fear when, in fact, as they found out, and we all know, their parents at that moment, at least, were not about to kill them. They were wrong. But the issue is, could they have honestly believed that, based on what happened that week, viewed through the prism of their entire previous life? Because if you or I or any of us, the non children, at least not this kind of in this courtroom, walked in to that house on Elm Drive and had had the same interchange with Jose and Mary Louise Menendez that Eric and Lyle did, none of us would have thought, oh my God, they're about to kill me. We just wouldn't have. Because we wouldn't have had the knowledge, from, of the special knowledge as it's called, of the prior threats of their hostile and aggressive behavior to us. We wouldn't be in fear of them. We're big people and they're not our parents. So they don't have that kind of power over us. We wouldn't understand the significance of the gestures or the significance of the words. It would mean nothing to us. And so as reasonable and reasonably normal, I hope, people in that foyer that night, none of this would have had meaning to us. But the issue for you is, did it have meaning for Eric and Lyle Menendez? And based on their history and based on what happens to severely abused kids and how they respond to threats and fear, could it be said? that they had an honest and actual belief that their parents were about to kill them. And the reason that is the question is because that is the defense in this case.